everybody. It is welcome to our holiday special. I have with me some great uh, fellow Christmas special lovers uh, here, including Culture Shots, uh, the fabulous Christy Winters, and some random geek. And if you guys want to go around and just uh, say hello and introduce yourself, go ahead. Why don't we go in the order that she gave us? So is that yeah. uh yeah. Hank? <laughs> That's you first. Hank. <laughs> All right, we lost Hank. Uh Christy, go yeah, ahead. Hey, hey everyone. I'm Christy. I have a YouTube channel. <laughs> uh, I like to talk about politics and feminism, but today we're talking about Christmas specials and I think things from our childhood. So this should be an uplifting and delightful conversation in contradiction to the rest of things that are going on in the world right now. So a little a little safe sp space for about an hour to think about holiday things. Hello, I am some random geek. Hi, uh, and I'm here to talk about movies and sure Christmas specials as well. And how's everyone? Good. <laughs> also uh, good. And Hank, do we have you back yet? Where'd you go? <laughs> oh dear. Well, I'm sure he will be uh, back at some point anyway. Great, so. Let's say hi to everybody in the chat already. Hello. Um, and anybody can feel free to just send this out. So the more the merrier. All right. So um, I'm not back. Sorry. Oh, Hank. Come on and uh, <laughs> come on and introduce yourself then. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, I have a. My name is Hank. Hank Jan Finke. I have a. Um, small channel culture shots which is about culture and how it defines us and how it's being hijacked by by uh, strange people trying to get their point across which is often um not the way the artist intended so uh and this is also i think why we have culture club so to 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 properly um talk about culture what what it actually well what we think it means and how it can be good for you. So, hi. <laughs> so we're here to make culture? Excellent. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to be um, asking some questions and then I'll have people just go around and uh, say what they think. Um, so I guess the first question should just be, which holiday movies, specials, or whatever uh, which mean the most to you, and if you wanted to say a little something about them. All right. Um, and we'll start with Hank. Uh, we'll start with me. Um, I um, This is one film which I also I have a small uh, playlist on my channel now, which is full of Christmas things I love from my childhood. One of the things which really stuck with me is a Dutch animation film, and for the longest time it was the only... Uh, feature-length animation film in the Netherlands, and it's if you understand what I mean, where a uh, um, an elderly bear, it's like uh, an amorphized bear, he's very popular in the Netherlands. He's called Olivier Bommel, and he finds this small little dragon, and he starts taking care of him, and then the dragon kind of changes, like in size, it becomes really, really big sometimes when it gets really angry and destroys everything. And so we, it wreaks havoc like in the town. And I watched that for years, every year with Christmas on Christmas. And it was, uh, I still, I still get a warm, I think many people in my generation get a warm feeling of when, when we see the film. Does it have so, a happy ending though? Cause you kind of left with it destroying the town. So. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, it, it, well, it's kind of bittersweet because he has to let go. He, the, the, the little dragon finds his mother, but yeah, um, I mean, the bear needs to let go of his little friend. So it's it's also a bit sad. Um, so it's it's kind of both. Yeah, it's happy ending, but also with a sad tinge. So that's my my childhood, my major childhood, yeah, movie, so to speak. And Christy. Well, in doing research for this series, I actually came across something I forgot, and I don't know if it will technically count, but I um, came across the 1974 
record, album, physical, LP of uh, Walt Disney's A Christmas Carol with Duck McScrooge playing Ebenezer Scrooge. I remember that one. Yes, I love that one. <laughs> exactly. And um, I listened to it, and it's even got all the pops on, on the album. And I listened to it, and I remember I listened to this so many times as a kid over and over and over because I lived in the middle of freaking nowhere. Mm. And we had a record player and maybe 25 albums. And, f- you know, five of those were Christmas albums, <laughs> and, and three were kids, you know, albums. But that one in particular, it was funny because when I was listening to it, I started singing along and I didn't even know I remembered the words until the music started up. And then there was a couple times, sadly, when the album must have just been, you know, so damaged that it skipped. And I, I immediately knew what text, like the script that was gone. Like, oh, they didn't say, oh, the, and about the Bells of London or whatever. So I really have unconsciously memorized that. And listening wow. to it really brought me back to the 19, late 1970s. And that rural Wisconsin house, I mean, I can, I can picture the Christmas tree with the multicolored lights. This was before all white lights was cool. This is when every single, you know, yellow, green, <laughs> red, blue, right? And um, uh, you just see, like, the carpeting and the big-ass television. I mean, it was the size of a cabinet. Uh, well, a small, you know, coffee table now. But, you know, so, yeah, that, I guess... Um, Anytime before this, I would have said something else, but because you picked today when I found it, that's what I'm going to say. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. That's so yeah. Sweet. Yeah. Good memories. It, yeah, man. It's like I wanted to try to find the the, the, the Disney Christmas Carol. No, Mickey's Christmas Carol with Scrooge McDuck as like uh, as Bernie's just screws. And because, yeah, I remember the Ghost of Christmas Past. Uh, you know, it was Ghost of Christmas no, the ghost of fe- 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 the gr- Christmas ghost of future. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, it was so menacing to me and like almost scared me as a child when I saw it. But it, that wasn't one that we were re- reoccurringly watching as a family tradition around Christmas time. No, those movies were that it was not a Christmas carol, but it was the Muppets Christmas carol. Yeah. And that's- mm-hmm. And that's why I'm always a fan of Michael Caine, no matter what terrible movie he does nowadays or something like that. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, it's so just like other uh, Christmas uh, favorites uh, in our uh, family. We did have the get set tape as well of like uh, the busy characters like singing along to the uh, Christmas songs. And so like 12 Days of Christmas and stuff like that. And so those are my childhood memories. But like, yeah, mostly it's just like a Christmas Carol, Muppets Christmas Carol, then a Christmas Story. And um, afterwards, uh, a bit later, it's now been 25 years since the night before Christmas. Yes. Which I think is more of a Halloween film, by the way. Which, yeah, but yeah, yeah. But uh, that's I don't, uh, it's both. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but I don't think you get fifteen favorites. I think, but uh, just to say, um, oh, who says? Well, in that case, in that case, no. <laughs> yeah, Chrissy Asity, how about you? What one have you been holding on to this whole time we've been talking? Um. Well, I'm. I think I'm a little different, and it, I think it's because you know my depression often affects me around the holidays, and I find a lot of the different things that come out kind of a a little bit much. So, but there is like, um, there are some Christmas songs out there that are real bummers that are really depressing and dark, you know, like Tom Waits um, and some people like that. And I have a sort of mini Christmas tradition where I just sit around and listen to really depressing Christmas songs. <laughs> so it's sort of like a purification from all the saccharineness that goes on, which is not to say that I don't love and am not fascinated with Christmas um, specials. It just, after a certain point in the year, it gets a bit much. And then I have to like do this thing where it's, it's gotta, it's gotta go, you know, it's enough. Right. <laughs> also, I think our relationship to Christmas changes as adults. There are, comp- there are more complicated emotions as we experience yeah. life. And mm-hmm. so I think that part of Christmas is actually a really important one. And one that obviously because there's enough songs to get you through the night, um, it's it's a common one as well. So it's an experience that a lot of people can relate to, whether it's, you know, baby, please come home or whatever. Um, you know, there's a lot of um, sometimes sad things around Christmas. It's a very stressful time of year for a lot of people. Mm. That's why there's death metal, as pa- as Pascal in the chat just said. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and speaking of um, 
uh, people in the chat, I think, Hank, uh, we have a request for you to show off your sweater. Oh, yes. All right. It's, uh, this, is, uh, this is my Star Trek Christmas sweater. So let's, let's see if I can look at it. <laughs> Make it snow. Make it snow. <laughs> make it snow. <laughs> I'm sorry, could you do that one more time? But could Chrissy Yossi lock the screen? Because when we make noise, then oh, you sorry. get turned off. So one more time, one more for the show, for the peoples. All right, wait a people. second. I don't right. know how to lock the screen. Click on his little, um, you know, the little avatar in the bottom right-hand side. Yeah, Just okay. click on his and it should turn okay. white. Yes. And now yes. This, he's only being displayed no matter what you see on our screen. Okay, here we go again. Oh, All right. My, my thing is stuck. Wait a minute. Yeah, so it says make it snow, which is a great, great pun. Yeah, um, the Star Trek. Here it is. Make, Make it, it snow. snow. There we go. Make it snow. I saw <laughs> this. I saw this for sale, and I waited for the longest time because it's kind of a fri frivolous purchase. Because this is not something you wear daily. Um, <laughs> and then it was sold out, and I was so sad that when it got back, they had one in my size. I had to buy it. I mean. <laughs> When you felt sadness because you could no longer own it, that's when you knew it was really belonging. As yeah. be it belonged to you. Yeah, yeah. that's when I, that's when I knew it was important to me. So, and I, <laughs> Captain Picard, I'm rewatching Star Trek as we speak, and mm -hmm. I love him uh, as a character. So, and it made me happy. Puns are great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Did they have Christmas specials on Star Trek too? N not that I know. Not overtly really. ones. Okay. No, no, because it's it's trying to be secular, which. Well, yeah, but there is also like a lot of pressure. Well, there's it's quite a common common trope in American long programs, you know, around the Christmas holiday oh, and yeah. New Year's. They have some sort of redemption story, you know, even uh, in the season, just the spirit of the season. So. Somewhere in the back of my mind, there's this tickling of a of a Ferengi episode, uh, but I don't really remember. We're Steve so... Shies when we. Yes. And Dave, get over here. Exactly. We have questions. <laughs> I'll get back to you because I'm rewatching every episode. So. All right. <laughs> well, there is a star. Someone has pointed out there's definitely a Star Wars Christmas special, though. <laughs> Technically. That made no one's list. That made no one's list in this room. That is for <laughs> Life Day. Yes. <laughs> that is also punishment. Oh. I think that's what you have to watch when you're on a timeout. Yeah. <laughs> you sit in the corner and you watch the, the Star Trek, or Star Wars, sorry, the Star Wars Christmas special for five minutes. Please, <laughs> three. Just three. No. Okay, four. All right, four, but then you're really going to be good after this, right? The one who came up with the Wookiee conversations. Oh, is, that's so dumb. I mean, it's with so no dumb subtitles. No. Like, <laughs> there's a lot of cocaine going around that writer's room. <laughs> things we missed. <laughs> okay, okay. There is one good thing about the holiday Star Wars special. It makes us appreciate how great of an entertainer B. Arthur was. B. Arthur? I must say, yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, Eh. Mm, I love it wasn't Arthur. her greatest work. <laughs> well, <laughs> sort of relative to what she was compared with, she, you know, yeah. in that I mean, she scene. held her own. Let's yes. Sort of, I remember her. The rest is just of, I mean, her, it's like Harrison Ford was was held hostage because he was there. It's like, ugh. Um, but yeah. I, I'm glad we have B. Arthur in the Star Wars universe. Yeah. <laughs> So, I'm glad that she exists there. Well, by the way, she's a badass. Uh, she was yes. in the army. Mm -hmm. she was, uh, yeah, she was uh, quite the lady. But back to regular Christmas specials that we actually enjoy. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so I'm going to start out um, with uh, this question. And should we, uh, you know what, I'm, I'll bring it to Christy first next time and then we can just go around kind of in the same way but just moving it around each time All right so it'll be christy some random geek and then hank um and so my question is assuming that you would agree that the christmas special christmas movie is a genre onto itself um would you also say that the christmas carol was sort of the progenitor and if so, what kind of 
themes and ideas and uh, tropes do you think that it is lended to other Christmas specials? Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, and I think, yes, it is. I think all, all stories about all Christmas specials, as it were, got their the door that was opened by by Dickens. And I think that the wonderful thing about the Dickens story and, and why it becomes, it ended up universalizing a very religious holiday is that he presented common human values that are associated with lots of religions, but in particular, you know, people try to associate, you know, want to associate it with Christmas and made a story about those things set at a Christmas time and a Christmas theme, but without really being religious. And that I think made it possible for other secular stories to do very similar things and with widespread or um, widespread acceptance. Mm -hmm. So you get the Charlie Brown Christmas and you get a lot of you know, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer Christmas, but all of them at the end of the day do have a, a sense of redemption, which you can, I think, trace immediately back to the Ebenezer Scrooge story. And probably that redemption, now that I think about it as I'm talking my way through it, is uh, Christians see the parallel with Jesus. But you can divorce Jesus of the notion of redemption because we all mess up in our lives. And so we all at some point need redemption. And we recognize the preciousness of being redeemed in the eyes of others you know people who forgive you and are you're able to move on that's actually a really really precious thing in a relationship and so i think that that concept in terms of us being social beings is something that taps into something very primal and universal hmm. i think that's a, a good point about the sort of secularism in particular i'd never really thought about it that way so that's that's um Good point. <laughs> All right, Summer and Geek. I try. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I, I definitely agree. It's definitely the Christmas Carol. That's the 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 genesis of like the Christmas kind of story. Because what what came before that? It's the for Christians it was the, the nativity and whatever the pagans uh, celebrate. I'm unfortunately I don't know much about that. My apologies and. Yeah, and I think and I, I do like what uh, Christy, uh, Christy Winters has said is that like it's definitely redemption is because as a Catholic, I can definitely say asking for forgiveness is kind of one element of Catholicism that I like. I hate the fact that we are automatically guilty just for being born. There's, but that's another topic that, uh, for later. And so, but having that that's kind of like idea concept in the trapping of just a normal like. Christmas story or a holiday story and something like that, it I think it is good and it and I, I do like the fact that like a Christmas Carol, just like Shakespeare, can be retold several times and in different settings as well. And so that that theme of redemption and asking for forgiveness can be there, and it is possible for anyone to be redeemed and be forgiven and something like that. So yeah, yeah, I have not, nothing much more, Dad. <laughs> All right, Hank. <laughs> um, well, I completely agree with, with Christy. Um, that I don't have much to add to that. Uh, besides that, um, something we touched on on the previous episode with um, uh, It's a Wonderful Life, which is basically, basically like an inversion of, because it's a very good man that's been mm -hmm. shown what would happen if he, if, if he wasn't there. And um, so, yeah. In complete agreement with Christy, that's all I have to say. <laughs> all right. Um, so uh, I I'm sure that there were Christmas stories before uh, uh, Charles Dickens, but I think that in terms of our culture now, he stepped that a Christmas Carol is definitely the progenitor, the yeah, the, the granddaddy <laughs> of the Christmas. There's also, um, isn't there, I want to say, oh, Henry, but it's not, maybe he's not the author. Um, also a British writer, though, because it's about a husband and wife who are so damn poor. And um, she has what she values is her long hair. And yeah. she sells it to buy him a watch. The and he, the Magi, I think, is that's what that is what that's called the title yeah and then the husband um sells his watch in order to buy her a comb and they open up their christmas presents and they're both completely useless um or something for his pocket watch and so yeah that notion of giving uh, beyond measure you yeah. know so captured in that. yeah i think that there's a couple things what is i think the sort of there's a gothic flavor to um 
a Christmas Carol that you you can see in other Christmas movies. And and I think it probably at least somewhat comes from there. Definitely That's culminates sort of, in the hollow on the Christmas whatever the Halloween the Tim Burton movie. What's it called again? Uh, Nightmare Before Christmas. It really culminates in that, doesn't it? Sort of yeah. the scenes planted well, by Dickens. If you if you want an interesting Tim Burton Christmas film, by the way, uh, uh, Batman Returns is also mm -hmm. um, one. I just suddenly realized that I'm sorry, it's a bit off topic, but no, it's <laughs> hands as well. Isn't that ever Susan Hands also Christmas? Oh yeah, uh, yeah. He has a he has a thing for Christmas apparently, <laughs> and Gothic, and Gothic. Yeah. yeah, so Gothic Christmas thing. Yeah, there we go. And um, I would also say that another thing that comes from it is that, and I think uh, some random geek touched on this a little bit, um, sort of the tension that is created that um, A Christmas Carol is really not a pro-capitalist pro movie. And mm -hmm. a lot of uh, Christmas movies are not pro-capitalist or not pro-consumerist but they also take place within the most consumerist holiday that we have, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's kind of, um, I, I find that tension a, a difficult one. Mm -hmm. you know? If you look at, tra uh, for instance, Trading Places, which is, has like this similar um, idea um, mm -hmm. of redemption, mm -hmm. um, that film, to me, I I love that film. That, that there's some problematic blackface and um, yeah, which really didn't. Last time I saw it, I was like, "Ooh, that's not good." But mm -hmm. um, when Eddie Murphy uh, goes to do the new job and actually said, "Oh, you're actually a bookies. It's it's actually they're bookies office for rich people." <laughs> and there you see like the two systems of of government in one hand, which is which is oppressive. And then the other hand, for rich people, it's like they can pr pretty much do whatever they want, mm -hmm. uh, which, which I think, well, um, it, it is interesting that that's one of, it's, it's a major hit. Um, how to say this? A lot of uh, Hollywood Christmas movies are anti-capitalist in the most capitalist way. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's Christmas as well. It's just like, it's just how capitalism can just like ex exacerbate or just like accentuate certain elements of it, like our need to buy and stuff like that, which is why I guess for, we, we can talk, touch on this later, but some of my favorite Christmas movies, like uh, Pascal mentioned in the chat, his favorite Christmas movie is Gremlins. It's kind of like the anti-Christmas movies, if you were. Hmm. Well, in that way, our, our Christmas special is actually slightly subversive. Mm -hmm. you know um but yeah. on that um i wanted when i watched your trailer for the trading places when you post uh, on your list and because it's quite long and just to your point about I, what you said about the blackface being problematic and, and other things in there but one thing i i watched with 21st century eyes and going gee that was kind of forward thinking there's a scene where don amici and the other old white guy can't remember his yeah. name are explaining the products that they're selling. He's pointing out pork bellies to Eddie yeah. Murphy. Saying, pork mm -hmm. bellies. This is why you might, how you, we would make bacon from a bacon <laughs> like you would find in a bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich. And then there's a, a shot of just Eddie Murphy kind of, he looks up and breaks the fourth wall <laughs> and looks yeah. at the camera is like, how dumb does this white guy think I am? You yeah. know, so and I just thought, I wonder how white audiences reacted to that when it first came out. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's a, a white explaining here before white explaining. Yeah, you know exactly. <laughs> so, uh, kind of, you know, um, since it's sort of come up, how do we deal with um, problematic elements in some of our old uh, ones? I mean, the I also love Gremlins, but I know that it's a little racist. <laughs> like there's there's some racism there mm. right and it's just something like i don't i i might cringe a bit at it and then just keep going because the movie overall i love and i can still enjoy it or i find that i can still enjoy it probably because i watched it when i was a kid and it was you know of course when i was a kid I watched it actually when it first came out because I'm old, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was at a um, 
it actually came out, I think June or July or something. And, and so we saw it, we had a, um, a drive-in. So I remember seeing it at a drive-in and just loving the shit out of it, even though mm. it was this just ridiculously bad for children movie. <laughs> 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 but what the hell, you know? So, but you know, now I, I see the, they're eating the fried chicken and doing the, break dancing or whatever they're doing and yeah. the gremlins and you go okay that whole scene at the bar was weird yeah. anyway yeah that's awesome <laughs> but not really yeah. so, uh, um, for people who um, somebody asked me so the gremlins are coded as black right mm -hmm. they are frequently coded as black and very they're given very stereotypical black things to do, you know, and, and keep in mind the gremlins are like two days old, you know, uh -huh. <laughs> like they're babies, but somehow they figured out how to do that. And in context with that, and also in context with the gremlins being, um, they're, they're these creatures that mimic humans without ever being able to be humans. <laughs> <laughs> so they're not like people, but they act like people. They pretend to be people. Like, so those things together are kind of like, oh, that's a little cringy. That's cringy. But okay, I'm all right with that. I'm I'm gonna just enjoy it anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Some random geek up, I think it's his turn to go first. Go for it. Uh it, it's kind of interesting that you mentioned of like how do we deal with our problematic aspects? Uh because uh the, really, the real reason I want to be on this hangout is just so that, like, because in the last hangout of, like, just, uh, Wonderful Life, Hank mentioned, like, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang is one of my favorite Christmas movies. I've seen that movie, Hank, is is an awesome movie. I agree. Uh, but uh, I just remembered after the hangout was over, oh, this is awesome. It happens to be a Christmas movie. Uh, Satoshi Kone's Togo Godfathers. And there is... I'm sorry, what? Tokyo Godfathers by Satoshi Kone. It's an anime. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's uh, the man uh, passed away a couple of years ago. He was a brilliant, brilliant filmmaker. Um, he died at the age of forty-five in the middle of his like in his current production. But anyway, yeah. uh, it's, is Tokyo Godfathers is about like three homeless people that like found the baby in the trash, and it, the whole movie is basically their adventures of reuniting this baby to uh, its a uh, its parent, its family. Is we it came out in two thousand three, and when I watched it in like two thousand five, there was a character named Hana, who. The film calls like a uh, homo or the F word when like the, the slur when Gene, who's a drunk, keeps the other homeless people is, is being drunk. And so I read I first read her basically as a drag queen. But now I read her as a trans woman because she said that, like, I was born as a mistake. God made a mistake with me. Oh, what would be great if I get to have a baby, too, just like Mary, because they just came from nativity. Yeah. And so how do you deal with that? Uh, I just go and say what Caitlin Moore, who's a writer at Enemy and editor at enemyfenders.com, just let me have my problematic favorites. You just mm. you just recognize the problematic things there and say, I like the movie in, in spite of that. And Tokyo Godfrey's is a great movie about family and how each of those characters we learn about their backstory a little bit and uh, how a, social, a socialist film as well. Yes, agreed. It's um, it, it family is just like a central thing because those three can create their own like little surrogate family there. They became a surrogate family figure to the baby as they're trying to find its family. And each of the other characters that they meet, the insular characters that they meet, they have their own struggles with family. And so, and it's just a movie that happens to take place on Christmas Eve. So it's one of those movies that happens to be Christmas, but you can just watch it year round. I saw it in the theater actually, and was lucky to do that in like May at the I MA movie festival. So yeah. So that's my answer. You just recognize the problematic things, then decide for yourself if you still enjoy the movies like that and stuff like that. Um, uh, there is a great article by the AV Club, mm -hmm. um, which is on the same subject. It says, um, it's written by Caroline Sida in 2015. It says, if you like Return of the Jedi, but hate the Ewoks, you understand feminist criticism. <laughs> um, yeah. That's and great. It, That's and it's, amazing. And that entire article just made it crystal clear for me 
that you can love problematic things, but you don't like that aspect of it. So I recommend everyone just AV Club, Return of the Jedi, uh, Ewoks. It's, it's an amazing article. Um, I really, they explain it better than I ever could. And by the way, the Ewoks movies are much better than prequel trilogy. That's my opinion. Was that your answer, Hank? Is it my turn now? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I was going to say, I have to say, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit hit, sitting here mind blown because I'd never, I haven't watched Gremlins in, in ages and I never heard about the coding thing or ever picked up on it. And it made me realize the extent to which when I say I grew up in rural, rural Wisconsin, I, I didn't meet anyone who was black until I moved um, away to a slightly larger city, um, you know, in my early teens. I, I, I only knew white people, but this nobody around me was racist. I knew of racist words because I've heard them, you know, I'd hear them, but I know I don't recall anyone really expressing racist jokes to me or racist stereotypes. Like fried chicken as a stereotype, again, wasn't something I knew about until like my teens. Really big bubble I lived on. <laughs> so that um, reminded me, it just when you describe that, suddenly like I had flashes of images of the film and realize, yeah, that makes sense now, but I never would have thought of it. And in terms of dealing with things that you enjoy that are, that have bigotry or something that is, you now find morally repugnant. I think our generation is probably having to do that more than any other generation ever. Yeah. yeah. Because we have all this art and now we're in a, basically, you know, in terms of consciousness raising, this is the, you know, we are the peak. Hopefully it'll get much better <laughs> as we go forward. But right now, this is maybe part of the challenge of, of uh, consciousness raising. We also have to not only solve the problems, but then grapple with um, how do we comport ourselves to the past. And I agree with pretty much everyone here. This is an es especially a challenge I'm facing because as I'm getting deeper, deeper into hip hop, which I really enjoy as an art form, there is there are some artists who have uh, a lot of misogyny and it's something that how do you again how do you enjoy something um and then also have that in it and what i what i decided was you know if i ever do a rap song reaction and and there's some misogyny in it i'm just going to put a big icon of a sad face or something in the corner because it's mm -hmm. it's ruined the enjoyment of that piece of music to me that's what that's what it is there's a little bit of that song now that's ruined for me forever but the overall song I like, and I guess that's how I'm dealing with it. And it probably would apply to other forms of art and his other you know, people in history as well. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I totally agree with you that this is just, uh, this is part of the modern age and you know, how I talk to people sometimes and say, look, aren't we glad that we've progressed to the mm -hmm. part that we could look back and, and say, this is, this was wrong, you know, <laughs> like, oh, okay. Like, but back in the day, um, you know, kind of, this isn't a Christmas movie, but um, Breakfast at Tiffany's, I was never aware of like anti-Japanese racism. Mm. Like that was sort of a, a, um, a flavor of racism I had never encountered when I first saw the movie, because I was pretty young. Um, and so I had no idea what was going on whenever Mickey Rooney got on the screen. Like, like I was like, why do we keep stopping the movie dead to keep talking to this weird person? Like, who, like with the bad eyesight, I don't get it. Like it wasn't funny because I had no context for why it would be funny. And, and from that, I do think that, um, that I kind of, I can see uh, Steve Shives, who we mentioned before, had said bigoted humor isn't funny if you don't have some at least understanding of that bigotry. And mm -hmm. I, I got to agree with them. Like, if, I had no idea what they were doing. <laughs> I just thought they were just stopping the movie for no reason at all, like just to do nothing. <laughs> and it was just annoying, yeah. right? Um, so... Like, I think that hopefully the idea is now we can recognize the bigotry and eventually we can get to the point where it doesn't even make any sense to us anymore. Like, so hopefully we're on that, that progression, but it will always be a little weird because it will always be there. And it also um, becomes part of our experience of it, that discomfort 
becomes part of our experience of that art. And it wasn't for maybe people in the generation it was produced for, but that's mm -hmm. the legacy it will now carry with it. And it's the danger of putting bigotry into your art is that, as time goes by, people might stop listening to it, not because they don't like you. It's just because, you know, they don't want to be uncomfortable with all the things you say or put or uh, show um, on the screen or whatever. Mm. Yeah, it's also uh, what you said reminded me of uh, there's this right wing fallacy that the left can't meme. <laughs> That's because there's a, I think the reality of the left is complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, it requires nuance. And uh, the right has all these opinions which are like Mickey Rooney in Breakfast at Tiffany's. It's it's all broad. It's all uh, some. It's all based on hatred and based on the common knowledge of certain denominators. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also, I think, um, I think true art is is um, nuanced. Mm -hmm. There's a difference. Um, so, yeah. I personally, if you, if you go like, if you go back to Breakfast at Tiffany's, I was never really a fan because I prefer the book. Mm. I think the book is superior, um, and th this is me saying it. Well, I love Audrey Hepburn, but yeah, um, but yeah, also Mickey Rooney didn't help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, um. All right. Well. Oh, let's see. Maybe we can get back into something funnier or happier again. I had a question. If sure. If you're open to ones from the peanut gallery. Please. My question to the group would be, what makes a Christmas movie a Christmas movie? Ah. Because there are, as you said, you know, there's a lot of things that we've said, oh, this is a Christmas movie and this is a Christmas movie. Okay. What passes the line? <laughs> what? Okay. Very what's barely a Christmas movie, perhaps? So that's also what you're asking, or in some ways, yeah, like the Star Wars Christmas special is barely yeah. a Christmas. <laughs> like, <laughs> so it, you can, I guess that's the interesting like genre of films or specials is like, well, there's there are other holidays. How come there's not other holiday specials? They are. I remember a uh, claymation Easter cartoon uh, that I watched. Uh, not many. Thanksgiving ones, some Halloween ones, but then again, there's also the whole genre, genre of horror that just gets played on Halloween, but they're not actually like Halloween in movies. Some, and actually, back to Nightmare Before Christmas, that's one of the like, few Halloween holiday movies that not that isn't horror or isn't already scary or stuff like that. So for what barely makes a Christmas movie, back to the original question, it takes place on Christmas. So just like Bam Bam Returns, just like Remlins. It takes place... Weapon. What? And Lethal Weapon. Yeah. Uh, it, and Die Hard. Let's not forget Die Hard. Uh, it, it takes place on Christmas, and so it's just part in the background. What really makes something a Christmas movie, I think, if it's about... has one of the themes of family. Coming together, together as, a, as a family. Or... Adversity coming together as a family through adversity of some kind, or and where it's like the central things of what we associate to the sexual celebration of Christmas is in is is put in the themes of the movie. I think that's would be what would be a Christmas movie is if it has the spirit of what people would think Christmas is, and I think we can all agree that at least in the Western sense, Christmas is a family celebration holiday. All right. Um, I, I guess I differentiate a little bit. I, you know, uh, I'm not going to sit here and say Die Hard is not a Christmas movie or this one is or this one isn't, you know. Um, but I do think that Die Hard is a movie that could take place on another time. Like yeah. you could take Christmas out of Die Hard and have essentially the same movie. Whereas a lot of where a lot of other Christmas movies, like I don't think you could take Christmas out of Nightmare Before Christmas. You know, like it's impossible. And even Gremlins, I think, is a satire of Christmas movies in many ways. Gizmo you know? was a gift. Gizmo was yeah. a gift. Yeah. So it's uh, and 
again, I, I do agree that having the themes there is important, but I do think a lot of times movies will put in, and, and I see this in uh, like romance, like the Hallmark romance specials that come out. Um, it's like they're j they sort of borrow from Christmas. They borrow sort of the themes they borrow. It's like a little shorthand. It's an easy way to sort of say, family, warm, happy Christmas, yay, festiveness, right there, right? Like it's it's just, it makes it easier for them to tell the story that they're telling, but they're not really um, engaging with it in a deep way and it, it could be done without it. Like the same romance, boy meets girl story could be done in most cases, not in every case, um, but in many cases, they it's just useful to them, to the author or the person who's directing or telling the story to use those themes, to use those iconographies rather than, you know, they're taking from it, but they're not necessarily giving anything back. It's just useful. So I, I do kind of differentiate um, stories that really um, are involved with the holiday, are involved with, you know, breaking some of these ideas and thoughts and iconographies apart, and others that are just sort of borrowing off them to tell a story that is maybe a tan tangential at best. But do you think that um, Christmas uh, movies need to be uh, warm and uh, have a sense of community because I just no, remember no. The, yeah, for something like Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, which is an amazing film. Oh, I've never seen that one. Oh, with David Bowie, it's it's really really good. Mm. Um, and well, it's actually a war film, <laughs> and, and, oh. and a dreadful, uh, it's, it's a horrible war film. But great, brilliant. Um, but yeah, I, I, it, I think it's a very difficult thing to answer if you uh some of it has to do with i think the time where, like um sometimes just channels uh, like a uh, uh, television channel just 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 throw on something that's cheap during the holidays and that becomes a staple like it's a wonderful life or in the netherlands i think if if you understand what i mean that dutch film which i uh, the dutch animation film which i watched which I think turned into this staple in the beginning. It's like, we don't know when to broadcast it. Let's do it on Christmas because mm. kids are watching TV. And so it's uh, it becomes a tradition. And because if you look at It's a Wonderful Life, the ending is Christmas, but most of the film has nothing to do with Christmas. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think it has, it's like this weird combination of factors. Sometimes it's the theme. Sometimes it's the date when it takes place. Um, and sometimes it's just because, well, uh, the market decided it <laughs> to be. Yeah, I remember seeing Die Hard in July. Um, you know, when I was seventeen, when our French exchange student came, and that was the movie we took him to see. It was Die Hard in the the cinema in the theaters. That, that's a um, great film to, to but, see. In the yeah, <laughs> in the oh, it was amazing to see in the theaters. Yeah, I didn't realize at the time I was watching history, but I think for me yeah. it was a Christmas movie because I rem remember coming out and that that film had popularized uh hollis Cri hollis on uh, christmas on hollis um it was yeah. december 24th on hollis having the dog when i see a man sitting with his dog in the park it was a run dnc christmas song yeah, right? run DNC, yeah. <laughs> and you left the cinema i left the cinema like in the christmas spirit because they had talked about you know new year's and they were playing the music yeah. all along and it actually had a christmas feeling and the end, really, the, the ending was sort of, and it had gone through, of course, all the way through. And so even though it took place on Christmas, I saw it in July and I came out feeling like Christmas. And maybe that's it. Maybe it's a movie yeah. that makes you feel like yeah. Christmas is a Christmas movie. I have, by the way, I have a T-shirt which says Nakatomi Plaza, my Plaza Christmas Party. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> <laughs> uh, 1988 it also says so uh, if people smile at you you I'll know just, this I, person you could spend you know have a beer with or something <laughs> just <exactly>. wanted. <laughs> uh sabrina from the live chat i think i made an interesting observation i'm going to share a christmas movie is like pornography you know it when you see it <laughs> <laughs> all right 
quite good. Yeah. Because it, it also because the trappings of of the holiday spirit can also be done because like for Home Alone that could have been taking place uh, like any time a, a super rich family just goes on vacation and their Brett kid just like is in there and is terrorizing two people down under the lock that has to resort to crime because of poverty in order to like make ends meet. Now that I think about it, that makes that movie very interesting. Now if I should want, rewatch it through new eyes. But Christopher Columbus did. Like, I, just, like, decide to have it at Christmas and dress it in like red and greens and stuff like that. And there's the family theme in home alone as well. So that if it, again, I, I think like Chris, Alcy, Chrissy would have said, if it makes you feel like Christmas, I guess it is a Christmas movie. I am. Um, I think that it, it's even more than that. Cause I think that Kevin has sort of a, he has a similar redemption arc, but the, to some, somebody, a child, right? Because he's, a bitter, angry little kid in the beginning who wishes his entire family would disappear. And when they do, and he doesn't know why, he thinks he's just wished them away. His original um, mm -hmm. reaction is, woohoo! You know, yeah. like, we're going for, all right, I'm going to go make some crap macaroni and cheese and I'm going to have, you know, and he comes to understand through missing his family and missing, um, you know, and, and being around, he comes to understand, you know, what he misses. I think that there's like two big themes that you see. One is a pure redemption arc. And then there's another that's sort of like um, learning your role as part of a family person or as part of a community person, like uh, sort of, um, to that sort of maturity aspect where you translate yourself from just an individual out for yourself to somebody who's a part of a family or part of a, um, a part of a community. And I think you see that one a lot. And so I'm going to actually move from there. And Can you I can quickly make yep. a confession here for all of you friends that I feel safe with in here in this little hangout, public hangout. I'm going to confess something. All right. I've never watched Home Alone. That's totally fine. <laughs> You're not missing much. Um, if, you, if you decide to watch Home Alone uh, and you see Home Alone 2, which I also like, Donald Trump is in that. So be uh, yep. I've also never seen Dances with Wolves, but that was bigger in the 90s than it is. I today. haven't seen Dances with Wolves in here. I haven't seen Citizen Kane. I haven't, I haven't oh. seen Top Gun. <laughs> Um, oh, wow, that's that don't, don't, don't no, 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 Dan, Dance with Wolves and, and Citizen Kane are good films. Mm -hmm. Top Gun is, is it's cheesy, it's mm. that, I, I always say, different, yeah. I always <laughs> say to people, I already seen the anime version of Top Gun, and that's Matt Cross Plus the movie. So I interrupted Christiosity with my confession, we got off on a tangent. Sorry, yeah. sorry, that's all right. <laughs> I guess it's a good time for confessions too. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I'm going to ask why um, there's so few holiday specials in movies for that are led by women or that have female protagonists. And you can feel free to think about it for a minute, but I'm right. Like yeah, it's yeah, you are, you are right. You're right. <laughs> uh, well, Miracle on 34th Street. There is a, a, a young lady there, but that oh Annie. Is is also for me a Christmas movie? Mm. Okay, uh, because I used to watch it at Christmas. But yeah, but uh, yeah, but you're you're right though. I just gave two exceptions, but in general, it's all dudes. Yeah, I, I mean, think the archetype is a man's story. Mm -hmm. It's Jesus' story. It's Ebenezer yeah. Scrooge's story. So we have mm -hmm. two male archetypes, and there's no role model for a female unless you're just mimicking the male archetype. There isn't an independent sort of feminine woman sort of character that they've created a narrative around that is an independent, you know, has her own story to tell. Yeah, mm. even in like a uh, night before Christmas, I was watching it. It's still Jack Skeleton has the main character and he's the driving force of the story and stuff like that. But at least Sally was, uh, had her own agency, tried to escape 
several times from her captor, her creator and stuff like that. And even though she got in a situation where she has to be the damsel to be rescued and stuff like that, she at least was so the show's interested to try to rescue Santa Claus and was the one that knew, predicted, or saw a prophecy that this is all going terribly wrong. But, and she had the Cassandra problem of no one listened to her. Mm. Santa too, of course, is. Yes. Yeah, I mean, there are always these. There are always these sort of female characters, and and I agree. I think it. I think a lot of times the female characters are even stand-ins for the theme, like uh, like in It's a Wonderful Life, um, where the main character has to reconcile himself um, to the way that his life is as part of this community of Bedford Falls. And I think that, you know, she, his wife almost represents home and warmth and family. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that like a part of that is just this assumption that women don't have that arc, that they don't have to deal with that, um, that kind of becoming a part of their communities because that's just what women are women are the avatars of community and motherhood and family and love you know therapy yeah there there are no backdoll passing you know um pieces of work that we're talking about tonight none of them are going to pass the backdoll test these like women in the story are always there to support the men or the boys you know they don't have their independent stories uh, I I just thought of one, but that's is only because it's happens to take place on Christmas. And Christmas is in the title, but the problem with all the female characters is that they kind of still fit in their roles and fill fill into archetypes and tropes. But for another genre of movies, slasher, Black Christmas has a female lead. Oh, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> I would say I would say that the for ones sure. that have uh, female leads are the darkest. Like when I was trying to think of it, because I, you know, I was going through all these things and it wasn't until I was going through for this show that I was like, God, there are no women here. <laughs> like the three I could think of, the, well, Black Christmas and the two other that I could think of were like um, Little Match Girl, which is mm. fucking dark. And the, um, oh, wow. Uh, the Nutcracker, which is fucking dark. Like, yes. <laughs> like these are all like, and so uh, these sort of, I really have no idea why we sort of attach the gothic elements to the, to the female led stories with sort of the really dark elements. But um, I don't know, maybe other people want to talk about that. It's just, it just struck me as weird. Well, I think mostly, most of the time, if you have a, um, People think that that um, uh, if you look at most stories where women are the the, the protagonists, um, they're kind of scary because I think maybe because protagonists need to have certain sort of a certain agency, and our society doesn't really uh, prefer that for women. Yeah, and look who's writing the stories. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Well, so yeah, that's that's my uh, take on it. Another thing, too, is especially with the Christmas specials, you know, they were played for, you know, decades after they were initially made. And I looked back and watched from start to finish Santa Claus is Coming to Town. And there are parts mm. of it that are really adorable. And then there are parts of it that I just look at it and go, mm. like Santa has a song where he says, um, if you want a toy from me, come sit in my lap. And the cost of it is a kiss. <laughs> yeah, and I no, you That's held up so well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's a saint. He's a saint. Oh, a Catholic oh, also, saint. At one point, he says, "Oh, well, you know, if the kids are naughty, and he makes a snowball because he's learned, you know, blood magic from the White Wizard." Oh, yeah, the, uh, the winter, winter warlock. Sorry, the, the, what, yeah, the winter warlock. Sorry, not winter. the white wizard. That's something else. Um, <laughs> and he makes a snowball. He's like, I'm going to be able to watch them. So what <laughs> you got to go? He's like watching you all the time, and he wants you to come and sit on his lap and kiss him. I always yeah. found that part of the song creepy. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, it's it's very perverse. It's like yeah, peeping. You know, peeping uh, claws. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, Santa's a bit creepy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what do you think about Love Actually as a Christmas film? Haven't seen it. Because there also, are... You haven't seen it? Okay. You guys Although haven't I heard seen it? Of it. I've heard critiques yeah. of it that the women are pretty much non-existent in that film. Um, I wouldn't... 
they're definitely more men than women. Um, <laughs> but there are, because it's a series of, um, it's a series of different uh, uh, stories that sort of interlock and intersect. I think it's, um, it has its problematic elements for sure. And I think the stories that with the guys are the problematic ones more so than anybody, but a bit creepy, a bit creepy. Like yeah. there's, there's some creepy the stuff. The best man who's in love with his, um, his best friend's wife to be and kind of shows up at the door with, you know, don't tell him I'm here. I'm going to show you these weird this is the Thanks. this is why I haven't seen that well actually because it's a romantic film and there's always problematic as aspects in some romantic films. Um, and if, I think that's yeah. If you if if it would be realistic, you would have all these pictures. Don't tell them I'm here, and it would end with a dick pic. Yeah, <laughs> that's it, that would be a real life. But I, I, you know, overall, I think that it also had some. Yeah, you know, I think it was. It, was, it was good for what it was. Like yeah. it was, you know, um, a romantic Christmas movie and, you know, made a point about people having all different love being a many faceted thing in our world. And that's fine. Like <laughs> there are worse things that you could watch. Yeah. But it's because it, it kind of struck me as in, at least there are some women there with some, uh, with a, a storyline. But mm. yeah, still, still, it's and it's written by Richard Curtis, a man who I like because he he wrote Black Hatter. But um, oh, I love Black Hatter. Yeah, yeah. No female characters there, but uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, there's. Oh, it's also the English education system, I think, at work. But um, uh, yeah, it's it, industry, yeah, in the UK, comedy mm -hmm. general. Yeah, um, they had this rule now with the BBC that they have they need to have one female. A uh, guest, if they have a comedy show, at least, which I think is good. But for the longest time, the women were like, "Okay, now we sit there and we need to be quiet because the guys are talking." Uh, uh, but yeah, baby steps. Mm -hmm. Baby steps, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can I throw a loop again? Have how many here have seen the one about the snowman? The we're flying through the. Oh, air. I have. I, it's it's on the playlist, people. It is, uh, and it's it's beautiful. It's a I, beautiful animation film. Yeah, I watched it. Well, I didn't watch the whole thing, but I hadn't sat down and watched it start to finish. I've seen pieces of it, but I hadn't seen the end. Don't want to ruin it now because too many people haven't seen it. But that was a surprise. I'll just say, and then yeah. I guess we'll have to. Move on. So. <laughs> Uh, um, I'll admit for myself, earlier this week, I've kind of like had to yell at myself in my brain, Jonathan, you fail at nerd, you fail at geek, because I would say I'm a Rankin Bass fan because of the 1997 uh, Hobbit movie and the 1982 classic Last Unicorn. It wasn't until earlier this week they realized, wait a minute, they did the Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer and Frosty the Snowman? Oh, yeah. It's like, oh, it's, okay, I fail at geek. And I have to watch all of them and stuff like that. And so my Frosty the Snowman was one that I remember watching as well. And I did watch it uh, last night or earlier this week. And I still enjoyed it for what it is, uh, definitely. Yeah. Uh, the magician character, total capitalist as like he he doesn't care that his, the magic hat that he has. By the way, Frosty the Snowman is a golem. This magic hat is able to like animate this, create this bowl of snow to be a sentient being. He doesn't care about that. I can make millions off of this. Scheme, 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 scheme. He forgot to twirl his mustache as he has a snidely wet flash mustache. <laughs> yeah, so Rankin and Bass, um, they did those two that you mentioned and something like 10 other uh, mm -hmm. Christmas. They also did a Halloween one called the Mad Monster Party, which was also another between the some of the Christmas stuff and the Mad Monster Party. That's where you get Nightmare Before Christmas mm -hmm. from. Like it's it's um you know that it is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, there. Uh, may, may, may I interject one thing? Uh, I think we're. Uh, you didn't mean you have Frosty the Snowman, but we mean the animation film The Snowman, so not Frosty the Snowman. No, now we're talking you... about Frosty. The yeah, exactly. So that's that's that that's those are two different films for so the people who are, who are listening. 
Um, you will have a, 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 an early 80s animation film, which is, I believe, Oscar nominated or Oscar winner hmm. of 20 minutes about a young boy who builds a snowman, goes to bed, and then realizes that the snowman comes to life. And he mm. takes them inside, and he talks to them, and it, it's it's a magical film. It's truly beautiful. Mm. Right. So lovely. I'm glad we clarified that. And uh, I'm yeah, just going to all stars and Christmas specials. But I do want to get back to Rankin and Bass because they sure, sure. Yeah. they're a huge a huge name in this. So they also did Santa Claus is Coming to Town. Mm -hmm. They did the that one about the donkey that and the little drummer boy and the little drummer boy too. Um, it was them. They Rankin and Bass were the people who uh, sort of headed it up. Um, Romeo Muller did almost all of the um, the writing for them, and there was a Japanese um, animation studio that did the stop motion animation. Mm -hmm. um, and let's see, they also did the Thundercats. Yes, they did do Thundercats. They also did a, a TV movie which I did saw, and it's uh, it's been a long time since I've seen it again. Uh, Flight of the Dragons. It's it, track it down if you can, or try to find it through through other means. But Flight of the Dragons is also good. But yeah. Mm. Cool. Cool. Yeah. On on that, in terms of like the Christmas special and the uh, Rankin and Bass, I don't know how it was when you guys were growing up, but again, being out in rural Wisconsin, we had three channels, and it was usually CBS that had the specials because I remember that opening um, bit to it. You know, uh, actually, Creation's Cat sort of adapted it with the xylophone kind yep, of thing, yep. right? <laughs> so, <laughs> right, and we didn't you know, go to the cinema that much. And so at Christmas time, these specials became like a big thing in our house. And my mom would make popcorn. Well, we get out the, you know, the TV guide and circle like which night it was going to be on and what time. So we knew we'd be home. And then it would be the time, you know, like with 6.30 or whatever, seven o'clock, right before Charlie Brown Christmas special started. And she'd make popcorn and we'd all go in the living room and we'd watch the specials. Like that was definitely part of our, our Christmas ritual. So I'm wondering when you talk about the Christmas movies, like what what kind of memories are you guys bringing to them or what were, what were the rituals in your, your experiences of them? For me, uh, one we haven't mentioned yet, and uh, it's also animation, but it's not Wrecking Bass. Uh, it, uh, How the Grinch Stole Christmas by Chuck Jones. Mm. Love and, that one. Oh, I yes. love it, love it, love it, love it. Love it. Oh, anything by Chuck Jones. It, yeah. His like it, his like Jungle Book. Uh, he did a Horton Hills a Hoot that's on the DVD for like uh, uh, how the Grinch stole Christmas. So I was like, so at my household, it was that was definitely a family tradition. We would even read it, and all of us, all my brothers, would know the words to it to the point where it's like, okay, my dad goes, okay, why am I reading this? You guys all the know the lyrics. You can just read to yourselves and stuff like that. But we watched uh, how the Grinch stole Christmas. None of the other movies that even compare. Uh, uh, we would watch uh, if we had the chance we would go to the ballet and see the Nutcracker the actual ballet and we love the music to that in fact we would listen to it as we would like do puzzles and when we come to the <laughs> we did that as a family and that was a lot of fun we had to, I had to resist doing that well and I was at the ballet and and Muppets Christmas Carol. Oh, a Christmas story was also it wasn't that regular of on the rotation of a movie we would watch, but we love a Christmas story. I I became nostalgic for the 1950s uh whitewashed middle class America in the 1950s of because of that movie. On that, just in terms of how these things get into you know your subconscious, I saw last week that Trump eliminated uh the or two weeks in the last 10 days, he eliminated the pay rise for federal employees saying that the government didn't have enough money right before he flew to Mar-a-Lago. Yeah. But my immediate reaction, I, I read that headline and I tweeted out my immediate reaction, which was, you're a mean one, Mr. <laughs> Trump. You really are a hero. You know, because that was, that summed it up. That mm -hmm. moment in that song. Um, uh, yeah, sorry. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. Oh, um, I'm, uh, uh, that reminds me of uh, when Clark Griswold finds out he's not getting a Christmas bonus in oh. the Christmas vacation, which mm -hmm. is one of the greatest anger uh, uh, like blowouts I've ever seen. Um, yeah, I, I I love that film as well, I must say, uh, uh, Christmas Vacation. 
I need to see that one because I actually saw the first vacation movie, but I haven't seen a Christmas vacation. And I'm you hearing haven't? nothing. Okay, all right. <laughs> Why so, am I here? No. I know. No. You <laughs> should. It's I like it a lot. It's yes. It's I I yeah, it's right. Yeah. Randy Quaid right. is in that too, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he's good in that film. Yeah, he is. He's amazing. <laughs> he's amazing. He uh, does. He just, he does the character so well. <laughs> It's when uh, when Clark is just walking outside, he's taking out the trash, and there's his cousin, and he's emptying, uh, he's emptying his sewage in, into the sewer, and he says, "I'm I'm clearing the shitter." That's all he says, and you're like, "Oh my god!" It's that that cousin you you never want to see again, you can't get rid of. It's amazing. Yeah, I, I love that film. This is it, you know, I think one of the things that I hadn't realized until we did this show is that every genre seems to have its own Christmas story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even though Christmas stories themselves are sort of a genre unto them, as we said, unto themselves. And that, yeah, I hadn't, I mean, obviously I, I know about all the pieces, but putting it together, you realize the versatility of the story, I guess, maybe because it's so recognizable mm. that it can be taken by anyone. Is there a sci-fi or fantasy Christmas movie though, or a Christmas special? Well, we did talk about Star Wars. Star right? Wars. Oh, I'm I trying to forget that. <laughs> <laughs> Life day, but yeah. On YouTube, you have the uh, the uh, Captain Picard "Make It So" Christmas song, mm. which is which is which is, which is really fun. Um, I watched a film. Also, I watched a lot of films when I was a kid. My my mother always. Went to the to the local blockbusters, and she came back because I had two weeks off, and I loved cinema films. So just mm -hmm. two two bags of films, and I was like, okay, I'll watch that. And uh, one we always watch was um, uh, it's based on a book by Astrid Lindgren. It's uh, Ronya the the robber's daughter, mm. and it's sort of magical. It's sort of dark. It's very Swedish. It's a how it's a castle that's split in two, and the castle then gets oh both halves of the castle fight with each other. Mm. And she is like this little girl, and she befriends the boy from the other half of the castle. And uh, that's what I remember. It's been I believe thirty years since I've seen it, <laughs> <laughs> but it left a great impression on me because it was magic. It was friendship. It was. Like uh, you had these big guys with beards, and uh, that was her father. I mean, it was I, I. I thought it was amazing, and it was magical, and it was Astrid Lincoln, which I also adore. I must say. All right. Well. All right. So, I'm going to actually um, let the chat ask questions or or bring up anything that they want to have us talk about about their favorite Christmas specials or what have you. And while they're doing that, and I'll take them down, um, I'm going to ask uh, the question of what the fuck was up with Kurt Cameron's thing? Like, oh. does anybody have a thought? Like, what the hell? Uh, <laughs> I'm out of the loop, actually. Okay. Oh, that, that film. Yeah, Background of this is Kurt Cameron made a movie called Kurt Cameron Saves Christmas. And in it, he basically tries to do apologia for... Um, for why Christmas can actually be celebrated uh, and rationalizes the tree as being made of wood like the cross and Santa Claus, you know, being like Saint Nick and whatever else. And the main story or the main theme or the main message of the movie is eat, buy lots of stuff, spend lots of money because Jesus wants you to be happy. Does that kind of sum up the movie? Am I getting it right? Yeah. Okay. May I say, yeah. May I say on, on, on live... YouTube that that he's a dick. <laughs> Sorry, I, yes. I, I I I've hated that guy. I mean, I I grew up with growing pains, and mm. um, some some background on what a what an asshole he is. Um, he he was uh, okay. I need to get in. I need to get this off my chest. We're having confessions. This is this is this is terrible. Okay, mm -hmm. so the, the guy who played his fiance in the series. Um, uh, she was really nice, and they were gonna get married. And then he went away, and he came back as a born again Christian. Mm. And so the 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 person playing his fiance, he said, "You need to fire her because she was in Playboy, and that's against my religion." Mm. Mm. 
So suddenly they just fired her, and she had to she had to do this one scene, which is like this nonsense ending where she gets the blame for leaving mm. him. And when I found that out, because I loved Rome paints growing up, it's like it's, it's a bit of wholesome. But yeah, I I grew up like in the Dutch Bible Belt. I loved it. <laughs> and when I heard that, I was like, "You're such an asshole." It's yeah. Mm. And then you make a film about the meaning of Christmas. I mean, shame on you, sir. That's all I have to say about that. Um, <laughs> right. sorry, one, yeah, sorry. Some a good thing that came out of Kirk Cameron Saves Christmas is all the reaction videos. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Go on YouTube. Uh, I just noticed like there's um something about like I hate everything or whatever. One of those channels has one. Mm -hmm. There is a great I think it was even before God Awful Movies was God Awful Movies. It was when um, Eli Bosnick would occasionally just sort of pop up on the scathing atheist and do a film review with them. They did uh, a review of Kirk Cameron Says Christmas, which is hilarious. So <laughs> really go watch it for the reactions because people hated this movie and it's hilarious to watch them hate it. It's, it's just brilliant. So, mm. Well, it was truly the most bizarre thing I've ever sat through. <laughs> Well, one of them, like just just watching him talk about like Santa Claus beating up people, like this is a good thing. Yeah, yeah. Saint Nick's dick, his staff. He used to whoop ass with that man. He used to crack people on the head. Well, he was a are, yeah, well, we are talking about the same guy who said you can eat a banana because it's like God's way because you have the hand and the banana fits. And I'm like, are you saying that God doesn't want us to eat melons? <laughs> you know, so that process that humans have actually genetically engineered bananas to be longer so they're not originally like that we've we've manipulated them to yeah. look like that mm -hmm. but, god did them like that yeah. we did. this is when this is when dunning uh, this is when dunning kruger meets toxic christianity it's it's mm -hmm. so annoying mm. Mm. yeah he's oh. Did you sit through the whole music bit too, which apparently is like 15 minutes of the movie? When I didn't just... sit through it. Like, I got through, like, I don't know, probably maybe five minutes of it and just went, this is freaking okay. Never mind. Click. You know, like, what are you going to do? There's a group, there's a group <laughs> two guys who went to see it in the cinema and then went into their car and did a reaction video and their confusion. Just like the confusion of people immediately after watching this movie is like so hilarious. So sorry, just to push the reviews, they're really good. <laughs> but isn't it, it, this this entire idea? And they're also trying this in the uh, in the Dutch uh, fascists are trying the same thing. Oh, it's a war on Christmas. It's a war on the holidays. Mm. It's a war on our, on our Christian traditions. There was mm. this, um, there now uh, there was a store and says, okay, we have this this uh, bread, and normally it was called Easter bread, but now it's called holiday bread, because we can Ooh. sell it longer. It's That's a war on Easter bread. Yeah. <laughs> no, but then it's like, oh, it's a war on Easter. It's like it's like a knee fall to the Islamization of the Netherlands and blah, 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 blah. And it's the same thing in America. There's this so-called war going on on Christmas, while the next day, the day after Thanksgiving, people are beating each other up to get a discount on their first Christmas shopping. Black yeah. Friday. <laughs> I mean, I had we had black in the Netherlands. Even we had Black Friday week. Mm -hmm. How does that work? <laughs> it just does. Um, we, have, might... we, have, we had Black Friday Monday. <laughs> it's Cyber Monday here over here, or Cyber Tuesday. No, 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 Cyber we, Monday. we also had that. That's Cyber Monday. But yeah. Black Friday Monday is the Monday before Black Friday. <laughs> <laughs> You know, just in the chat when this came up, um, I don't know, I can't remember whose stream, maybe it was in the last t day I was on. I did mention the, the motto we all know or the chant we all know hey, hey, ho, 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 Merry Christmas, gotta go, go, go. We all, we all do that at our protests. Oh, oh. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Constantly. <laughs> it's a crowd favorite. <laughs> I mean, I don't think anybody here is particularly religious, in, unless I'm quite confused. Um, it is the winter solstice. Mm -hmm. So, it is. happy winter solstice to everyone. The um, sunshine. <laughs> mm -hmm. And. Uh, <laughs> It'll get longer now. Yay! Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's all I got. I knew yeah, someone. 
We have a question in the chat. Which alien movie is the best? The first oh. one. Ooh. Mm. You were quick off the bat there. That's my go. choice. I mean, Aliens is good, but uh, no, for me, Alien. It's just, yeah. I think a better question is in which genre? genre, Because I think the first one's a horror film. The second one is an oh, action yes. film. Agreed, and agreed. The other ones are in the shit genre. So No, yeah. no, I, I, I both like, I think three is a bit underrated. Mm. That's um, weird. Awful. And, and, and four, I no. No, I sat through that shit. And that was awful. Oh, no, no. <laughs> oh it was I, so boring. I really it. liked it. I really liked okay. it. Sorry. Well, yeah. <laughs> we can I agree haven't seen that yet. Don't, don't see it. <laughs> I've seen uh, the Prometheus is not a good movie. Alien no. Covenant is slightly better, but not by much. And I did not, I only saw like bits and pieces of Alien 4, and it's just like, it has Ron Perlman, but I don't think Ron Perlman will save it. And the um, alien. And the Alien vs. Predator movies are terrible. Yeah, they are. They are. Absolutely. Um, I, I see another great question. But, oh, wait a minute. Before we go, uh, Chris Yossi, what's your favorite Alien film? I, I don't have a favorite Alien film. Okay. I, don't, like, I, I like Alien and I like Aliens. I, don't, I didn't see three. So, mm. um, yeah. So, I, I can't really... I don't have a, a an opinion. I liked them differently. Mm -hmm. The so. first time, yeah. The first time I saw Aliens, the second one was I was on university campus, and it was the first time I got drunk. I wouldn't really get drunk. I was drinking like wine coolers because oh, know, and um, yeah, we got pizza. wine coolers. It went the first time, damn straight, I did because uh, I didn't drink in high school really. Oh, um, okay. I didn't drink till college, and uh, yeah, they got pizzas and wine coolers, and they put on Aliens, and it was, yeah, that's my first experience of the Aliens film. <laughs> Memories. Um, I see another question in the chat, which is a really good one. Uh, I don't know if we can go to the next one. or uh, I might take it. Up, yeah, because uh, that was from Sabrina, which is, uh, uh, which Disney movie would make the best Christmas special? <clears throat> I, I'll go say uh, Beauty and the Beast. Not Frozen? Come on. Ooh. Mm. Let it go. Mm. Yeah, mm. let it go. It's, <laughs> it's about families as well. So it's families, is, we established one of, one of the things you can have a central theme to be in a Christmas movie that makes it Christmassy. And so Frozen is a... Right? Does it have some sort of reindeer-esque beast? I haven't actually seen yes, it. Yeah, there's yeah. reindeer. I, I love the fact that the reindeer was not talking, yet how he looks and how the other character talk for that reindeer, it makes it look like the reindeer is, is talking. So I love how they subverse their talking animals trope. They had talk, talking gnomes and magical creatures, though, so they still couldn't keep the talking animals out of their uh, Disney movie. But or I did... Flip, yeah, it I did on like his, I, flip it on his head, Moana. Wow. Mm, ooh. Ooh, yeah. We we got we got to remember the southern hemisphere also has Christmas. It's just like it's really warm for them. Well, it's not in the southern hemisphere though. Oh, yeah, that's right. Mm. Uh, no. It's right it's around Hawaii, right or not? Uh Polynesians? Uh, they I don't know. But definitely oh, yeah. Oh, no, wait a minute. Oh, no, if it's Samoa because uh, then it's the southern hemisphere, right? Oh, I don't I don't really know. Yes, Hawaii. So yeah. You. You're uh, asking an American geography. Come on. <laughs> Sabrina said, Yes, I want a Moana Christmas special now. So oh, that would be wonder. amazing. Yeah. 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 Well, Miranda, of course. Mm, mm. Yes. Uh, there was another okay. question earlier in the chat. Uh, what about Miracle on 34th Street from 1995? I have not seen the 1995 one. Well, it's, and... it's, it's also good. It's, okay. Yeah. It's with um, uh, what's her name from? Um, oh, I love her. I follow her on Twitter. She's great. Uh, Mara Wilson. Oh, okay. Mm. Yep. And, and Rob Morrow. Morrow. Guys, I'm gonna have to go in ten because I have to set up OBS still for Kevin, and we need to run a test sure. before. Our show. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, uh, we have from Adam our Christmas specials, The Meaning of Life. I'm gonna go with. No, but they certainly are interested in the meaning of Christmas. Mm -hmm. Could the meaning of life be a Christmas movie? 
<laughs> I say yeah. life prime is, in my opinion, but the, because there's a bit of a nativity in the very beginning, but that's about it. <laughs> and Shannon asks, why does Merry Christmas have to go? Um, I don't know. Uh, I'll tell a, a, a ridiculous story because I do know all about the sort of if you've ever worked in retail mm -hmm. um, and I have and I've, I've done that around Christmas and um, I, I think that you should just like don't have what Walmart says on its decorations be your fucking it, it doesn't matter like if they, if it made them money, like Target or any of these malls would say, go suck a tailpipe, it's fucking Christmas. Like if that made, <laughs> if that was what it took to make money. <laughs> that's what they would put. But because, you know, happy holidays or Merry Christmas does the job better, that's what we get. So that's good. That's fine. Like, but it's, um, so I'm at this, store and there's Christmas decorations up sort of the generic there's wrapped gifts and little jingle bells and whatever um and so I see this little girl uh probably six or seven and she's looking at these and stupid fucking me I gotta open my big mouth and say oh is Santa gonna come and give you presents <laughs> and I her mother's there and her mother's like I'm glad you asked this. This is a good teachable moment. And she brings the little girl over to stare at me and explain that she doesn't celebrate Christmas and that Santa Claus doesn't come to her house. And the whole time she's staring daggers at me like we had we celebrate Hanukkah. You mm. Bitch, you had to do this, didn't you? Like <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. So I'm sorry. I, I I'm sorry. Like, so it's just you know what? The people who work in in retail don't want to have your fucking deal with no. this Christmas issue. They just yeah. want to do their job. So yeah. just leave us alone with the Merry Christmas and all mm -hmm. that. You know. <laughs> did, did they talk about the Christmas armadillo? <laughs> <laughs> the Friends episode, if for those who've seen it. <laughs> I remember now. <laughs> so all the Santa costumes were sold out, so he's like, I need to teach you what the meaning of Hanukkah, and he, he was dressed as an armadillo. Yes, mm. exactly. Right. Sorry, uh, I was just reminded of it. But yeah, you're absolutely right. I work in retail, too. I don't care. I don't care about your standard jokes. Every time it's like, we like a bag with that. And I said, no, I'll eat, I'll eat it here. I was mm. working at a CD uh, um, uh, at a record store. And, mm -hmm. I, and the first time you hear it, it's like, ah, fun. <laughs> oh. uh, but everyone has the same joke. It's, mm -hmm. it's yeah. mm. don't, don't, don't joke with people who are just here to help mm. you with your stuff. Yeah, <laughs> I worked at a gas station for four years, and oh. so not only do I sometimes get the jokes, uh, I will get the complaints about the gas prices. Oh yeah, mm. yeah. I, well, I, thankfully I, you set them because yeah. you, <laughs> you I the same your job. I said the same thing. I was working at this really large chain, and this guy said, "Well, you're really expensive." And I'm like, "Dude, if I if I could make the price, do you think I would stand here?" <laughs> to you, he said, "Well, it's cheaper around the corner, so we'll go there." I'm not. <laughs> I would I have made less or more if you buy it. Just go away. <laughs> I would have been like, "Well, sir, thank you very much for the compliment, but you haven't asked me my rates yet." <laughs> <laughs> well, nice, nice. Mm. Yeah. <sighs> you can't afford me. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so, so on that. <laughs> Merry Christmas message. Uh, <laughs> if we have missed your uh, question, I am very sorry. Um, but I want to wish everybody a happy holidays and happy new year and Merry Christmas and Hanukkah and Kwanzaa and the solstice and everything else you could possibly think of. The top <laughs> ten and a very solemn Ramadan. <laughs> <laughs> Ditto. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.